Yes, Professor Thomas Seafried is right. Cancer is a metabolic disease. That's why I'm still alive. Can you explain, so first of all, what like cancer specifically is? A cancer is defined as cell division out of control, dysregulated cell growth, okay? Um, most um, oncologists think that this is the result of gene mutations. Um, our uh, theory is different. It says that the origin of dysregulated cell growth arises from the mitochondria in the cytoplasm and that uh, the mutations are uh, downstream effects. They are not the cause of cancer, they are the effects of cancer. And that the dysregulated cell growth is the result of mitochondrial dysfunction where the cell can no longer generate energy through oxygen but must rely on ancient pathways of fermentation to generate energy. So energy is everything. Without energy, nothing can survive. Uh, energy is the key essence uh, of life. Cancer cells generate energy through fermentation. Uh, normal cells generate energy through oxidative phosphorylation. So the main difference between cancer cell and normal cell <clears throat> is how they generate energy. So when you generate energy through chronic fermentation, you collect all these mutations and all these things that people study. They're all downstream effects. They're not the cause of cancer. The cause of cancer is a dysregulated uh, uh, respiratory system coupled with increased fermentation. And the fuel that drives the fermentation is the amino acid glutamine and the sugar glucose. So without glucose and glutamine, no cancer cell can survive. All other issues are less important. So you need drug, you, you can manage glucose with diet, uh, but you will need a drug to restrict the glutamine. Mm. So uh, you must target glucose and glutamine simultaneously, that means together, while transitioning the whole body over to ketones, um, which are derived from fatty acids. So ketogenic diet, Together, a uh, restricted ketogenic diet will lower blood sugar, elevate ketones, uh, which is the ketones are for the normal cells, not the tumor cells. And then you target the glutamine at the same time. And this strategy should manage all major cancers without toxicity. The, the, problem, is, the problem is no one can understand this. I, I might as well be speaking in ancient Egyptian or Greek, uh, no one can understand what I just said. Um, I, I, it's very simple, but no one can understand it. So I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm always wondered, how is it possible that I say cancer is a mitochondrial metabolic disease driven by fermentation, and the fermentation fuels are glucose and glutamine, and the tumor cells cannot burn ketones. So the solution to the cancer problem is simultaneously restriction the glucose and glutamine while transitioning the body over to therapeutic ketosis. Keeps the normal cells healthy and targets and kills the tumor cells at the same time. So, but for whatever reason, uh, people cannot understand this. They can't, Nobody. I don't know, I, I think there's two things. Number one, they don't want to understand it. Uh, and number two, uh, it's hard to generate revenue uh, when you uh, have a very simple solution to a problem. In other yes. words, we do not think radiation is necessary for the ma managing cancer, the majority of cancers. We uh, don't think uh, toxic chemo is necessary for managing the majority of cancers. Immunotherapies that are the, the hot thing today are all based on the gene theory of cancer. If the gene theory of cancer is incorrect, you're not going to achieve the uh, success um, that, you would, that you would have.
so I, I'm telling the world that the view of cancer, the reason why we have so many deaths and suffering from cancer is because the theory is incorrect. Once the theory, once cancer becomes recognized as mitochondrial metabolic disease, the disease will be managed effectively. But it's hard to convince, hard to describe this to people. Uh, lay people understand it more than the scientists understand. I think the scientists understand it. They just don't want to. They don't want it to happen because that means whatever they're doing is probably insignificant. <clears throat> which is uh, which is kind of unsettling for the majority of cancer researchers. And that is a very disturbing uh, to the majority of cancer re researchers, that most of what they're doing is insignificant. Ah, it's terrible to say that. You know, I'm sure that if someone were to come to me and say, you know, your mitochondrial metabolic theory is wrong and everything that I've been doing is incorrect. My argument is, show me. Tell me, pro pro provide me with the data showing that I am incorrect. And I will be more than happy to debate and discuss this with anyone. And I will clearly show how the, the, how the somatic mutation theory, the gene theory, is uh, incorrect. They cannot explain the nuclear transfer experiments. They cannot explain why we have all these oncogene uh, driver genes in normal tissue. Uh, how do you explain uh, cancer mutations in normal tissue that never become cancer? How do you explain the fact that there is some tumors that have no mutations? So how can you tell me that cancer is due to genetic mutations when we have all of these inconsistencies? So uh, the mitochondrial, the, the, the somatic mutation theory or the gene theory of cancer is flawed, okay? So most of the cancer treatments are based on the gene theory of cancer. If the theory describing the disease or the phenomenon is incorrect, what is the probability of treating people with therapies based on an incorrect theory? You're not gonna get the resolution. You're not gonna get the effects. So we have to kill millions of people worldwide by toxic treatments uh, because people cannot accept the fact that they might be incorrect in their way of understanding cancer. I mean, eventually at somebody your age, if, if you live to be 76 years old and we are still irradiating and poisoning people to make them healthy, uh, then we have a real problem. I hope it doesn't right? happen. Yes. Well, I hope so too. <laughs> you know, uh, let everybody know it's not a genetic disease. So all these crazy things that we're doing to people, why, why do you think, are people excited when they have cancer that they go and say, whoa, I'm so excited that I can get now radiation and toxic poison. You know, I didn't like the color of my hair. Now I'll take this chemical and all my hair will fall out and I can put a wig on and I can change my hairdo uh, as the result of the cancer treatment. And anytime, anytime you see some person with a bald head from cancer treatment, that person was treated by someone who doesn't understand what cancer is. Otherwise the head, why you kill, why your hair falls out? You're trying to kill cancer cells not make you go bald, right? So uh, all of these crazy things that we do to each other, it's just unbelievable, unbelievable. So um, anyway, what are you gonna do? That's the way it is. Yeah, well, um, that's important because people say, well, where's the evidence? And the evidence is we are publishing case reports of individuals who do metabolic therapy and live far longer <clears throat> than they would have had they done conventional therapy. We are, are rescuing some uh, stage four cancer patients from their disease uh, by giving them uh, metabolic therapy as opposed to uh, radiation, chemo, or, or immunotherapy. So um, there are no clinical trials yet, mm -hmm. mainly because uh, no hospital wants to uh, pay for this. How, how you, I mean, usually pharmaceutical company pays for clinical trial. Um, no pharmaceutical company has come forward yet to say we would like to do a big clinical trial on metabolic therapy to show that we do not need immunotherapies, radiation, or toxic chemicals. Uh, there's no level of enthusiasm to do something like this right now. So uh, we need a business model. And I think the business model will allow us to move forward. 
Also, we don't have trained physicians and oncologists. They, what I said to you, uh, they can't believe what I'm saying because they don't understand the concepts, or even if they do understand the concepts, they don't they don't want to believe it. So, um, so we just have to keep doing case individual case reports and and publishing hard scientific evidence supporting the, the theory, and then eventually things will change. Just a matter of time. You have been able to prolong people's lives through the metabolic uh, therapy? Yes. This is another important point. You should not consider metabolic therapy as a cure for cancer. Metabolic therapy is simply an approach to improve uh, overall survival and quality of life. Mm -hmm. Metabolic therapy will allow cancer patients to live much, much longer with a higher quality of life than the standard treatments that we currently have for cancer. Does that mean cure? We have no idea. All we can say is, is if, if everybody is uh, talk about cure, well, it's clear that standard of care is not curing the majority of people with cancer. And if those people do survive standard of care, they often pay a big price for this. They have many, many adverse effects in their body. They get other cancers. They have hormonal imbalance. They have microbiome imbalances. They have neuropsychiatric problems. They pay a very severe price for surviving standard of care treatment to manage their cancer. Metabolic therapy does not produce the kinds of any kinds of adverse effects. It makes you healthy. It makes you feel better. You do not have to lose hair. You don't go bald. You don't have uh, nausea, vomiting. You don't have these kinds of things. So you just simply kill cancer cells gradually while improving the overall health of your body. So uh, metabolic therapy will replace toxic standard treatments in the future. Right now, uh, people are just unfamiliar with the concepts. And can you describe what the what you what the people need to do, or like what the patients need to do to get into ketosis and to take yeah. out the glutamine? So when the sugar? cancer patient presents to the clinic, uh, what we do is we take complete b blood work. Uh, we measure all uh, parameters in the blood make sure no bacteria, fungus, or parasite infections. Um, we uh, transition the patient from high carbohydrate diet to very low carbohydrate ketogenic diet, which can take uh, several, uh, uh, at least 10 days to, to 15 days. Um, and then once the patient is in uh, nutritional ketosis, by measuring blood glucose ketone index, um, we then administer the drugs uh, to mm -hmm. the patient uh, to target, effectively target the glutamine and the glucose. And we can use hyperbaric oxygen and we can use, sometimes we use very low dose chemo, um, very, very low dose chemo, which has almost no side effects whatsoever. It's just the drugs work so much better uh, when patient is in therapeutic ketosis. Um, so it's a gradual degrading of the tumor over time. Uh, we're trying to complete the whole process within within a four to six month period, uh, similar to uh, what would do for standard of care. So uh, um, except that now the patient emerges in a very healthy state uh, with cancer managed. Now we don't say cancer is gone. We say cancer is managed. It may still be there, but not growing or it could be gone. Uh, you do uh, MRI, cats, pet, uh, the various non-invasive technologies. We don't like to use biopsy uh, to assess the cancer. Uh, biopsy has runs the risk of spreading the cancer uh, throughout the body. Uh, we, c we do surgery only after the tumor is shrunken down, very small, uh, without any inflammation. And then the surgeon can remove the tumor uh, quite effectively. We don't like to use surgery at the beginning because it could spread the tumor, just like biopsy. So uh, we have a very clear uh, protocol for the treatment of cancer. 
that is based on cancer being a mitochondrial metabolic disease. And this will all be worked out very, very thoroughly in the clinic, not terribly complicated, uh, but will be highly effective. What do people need to eat to be in a ketogenic state? Well, you have to uh, be under the guidance of a certified um, practitioner, mm -hmm. whether that is a nurse, nurse, uh, physician's assistant, physician, nutritionist, the patient needs to be guided. And the patient also needs to monitor their own blood work. And we published the uh, glucose ketone index, uh, and there's blood uh, meters now that you can buy on Amazon uh, that will allow the cancer patient to monitor their own blood work. And then they would go to the physician and say, okay, I am in ketosis. And at that time, they would be administered the drugs uh, that work together with the ketosis to kill the cancer cells. You know, we use glutamine targeting drugs. Uh, we use uh, parasite drugs, embendazole, fenbendazole. And it's these drug cocktails used with nutritional ketosis that will kill the majority of cancer cells or bring tumors into complete management. No cake, mm -hmm. no sfoyadel, none of these kinds of pastries. Okay. Um, you know, this all has to be removed from the diet until the cancer is managed. Once mm -hmm. the cancer is managed, uh, it may be possible to eat a pizza. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, until that, you have to recognize that it's your choice. It's the patient's choice. Do they want to live or do they want to die? <laughs> it's not a, it's, it's, it's a choice, right? I mean, you don't tell the patient, do you want to live or you want to die? You know, it's just, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not saying it. I mean, if they want to eat cake and cannolis, I mean, that's their problem. You know, we had an Italian patient we had from, yeah. uh, where was that? Maybe it was Milan. Mm -hmm. Milano. Um, she was doing very, very well with glioblastoma on metabolic therapy and thought she was uh, cured, uh, but she was not cured. And then she went back and ate the cannolis and the cancer came back and she died. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, no cannolis. No cannolis. <laughs> And you also have to... Unless you have a keto cannoli. Okay. Uh, I don't know if that's possible. See, food food uh, people are working on all these kinds of keto foods. But I can tell you, a, a keto cannoli is not as good as the regular cannoli. And what about carbs? Are they helpful or detrimental? What, was, what about what? Carbs. Carbohydrates. Oh, carbs. Yeah, no, no. Carbs are carbs are driving the tumor to grow faster. So uh, you want to restrict carbohydrates. The tumor needs carbohydrate to grow. Now, it's it's really the tumor needs glucose to grow, mm. and glucose comes from carbohydrates. The worst carbohydrates are the highly glycemic carbohydrates, the highly processed sugars. Complex carbs um, are less provocative. Mm. but uh, still should be restricted uh, significantly. So the best, so, because ketogenic diet is zero carbohydrate diet, extremely low carbohydrate. Your body can make carbs from within. So uh, um, the problem is they make very little carbs from within. It's not enough to drive the tumor. So the carbs, external carbs are what's needed to drive the tumor. Once you eliminate all external carbohydrates, the carbohydrates that the body makes is mostly for the brain and all other tissues uh, will burn fatty acids and ketones and, and the tumors cannot burn fatty acids and ketones, regardless of what, what these other people might think. So basically the most beneficial things to eat for the body is animal protein and fat. Is that correct? Yeah, well, it could be animal protein or it could be uh, vegetables. Mm -hmm. As long as, lo whatever you eat, is it can't elevate the uh, glucose ketone index. If you keep your glucose ketone index low, then it doesn't make any difference what you eat. As long as you have a low glucose ketone index. Some people do Mediterranean diet. Some people do vegan diet. Some people do carnivore diet. Mm -hmm. you know, it's just, it's all, almost like what, what did human beings eat 50,000 years ago? What was the diet for the human being 50,000 years ago? 
It wasn't cannoli. There was no cannoli in the environment at that time, right? No rice. Uh, 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 no pasta. No pasta, right? So, uh, listen, it's a hard thing to do. If you're Italian, you don't eat pasta. It's hard. If you're Chinese and you don't eat rice, it's hard. If you're Irish, you don't eat potatoes. It's hard, right? Yeah. Bread. What about bread? No bread. So, uh, so yeah, try it. Take away pasta and bread. It's going to be hard, right? Right. So, um, yeah, uh, no carbohydrate. Carbohydrates must be restricted. But it's not forever. It's just until the tumor is managed. And once the tumor is managed, then you can uh, go back and, and maybe not to the same level, but you can certainly not be completely restricted. Some people told me um, they would rather die than not eat pasta and bread. So um, that's their choice. Okay, then die. You know, it's not my, it's not my problem. It's your problem. You know, I, had, I, I have a Korean, Korean told me he can never live every day. He has to have rice every single day and would rather die than not eat rice. So I said, okay, that's, so, that's your choice. That's not my choice. So, uh, right? Yeah, you gotta want it. Yeah, you wanna survive, you gotta do what you need to do to kill the cancer cells. And then once the cancer cells are managed, then you might be able to eat rice or pasta, but not during the management period, not, not, mm. not that at all. Mitochondria needs to be in a healthy state, correct? Yes, yes. Okay, a mitochondria need to be maintained in a healthy state. And, um, you know, uh, exercise is excellent mm -hmm. to maintain this. <clears throat> uh, periodic fasting, um, what they call intermittent fasting. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to do long-term fasting or a zero carbohydrate diet for a week. You can do that. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways to lower your blood sugar and elevate your ketones um, to prevent uh, cancer and keep your mitochondria healthy. You know, the, there's a lot of mutations. Mo most cancers have mutations in the nucleus, mm -hmm. um, but that's not the cause. That's the effect of the damaged mitochondria. Okay. No cancer is known that has normal mitochondria. So the mitochondria being abnormal forces the cell to ferment, uh, use energy without oxygen, and glucose and glutamine are, are, those, are those fuels. So the nuclear problems are downstream. They're not the cause, they're the effects. So most people in the field study the effects, not the cause. Consequently, we make no major advance in cancer. Once we understand that it's a mitochondrial metabolic disease, then you're going to see huge, huge uh, advancement in managing the disease. Uh, to ask the simple question, can a uh, cancer uh, cell uh, direct normal development? Um, that was that they were not testing the mitochondrial metabolic theory. They were testing whether or not a cancer cell can direct normal development. Mm -hmm. And the answer is uh, uh, yes, up until a point uh, when the organism would abort. Um, so uh, frogs with uh, kidney cancer, Mm -hmm. were able to develop into a tadpole uh, from the nucleus of the tumor, but not into a mature frog. Um, uh, mice were produced from melanoma nucleus, uh, but not an adult mouse. Um, they, they were all aborted in some way because of the mutations in the nucleus prevented development, but they never developed cancer uh, from, the, from the tumor nucleus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, what is showing is that normal mitochondria can suppress the abnormal cell growth. And uh, um, this was done by uh, uh, many of the world's best developmental biologists. And it was repeated over and over again in many, many independent studies. Strongest evidence to prove that cancer cannot be a nuclear genetic disease. Those, those, those findings show that cancer cannot be a genetic disease. People need to get over this. They need to understand this. Until they understand, if they cannot understand what I just said, then they'll never understand anything. So, uh, um, but the nuclear transfer experiments prove that cancer cannot be a genetic disease. And uh, those and other findings as well that I put out in my big papers. So, yeah, I mean, normal mitochondria suppressed abnormal cell growth. Abnormal cell growth comes from 
uh, defective in the mitochondria. Mitochondria maintain the differentiated state of quiescence. When the mitochondria become defective, the cell falls into a fermentation metabolism and loses growth control. Not that complicated. Not, to me, it's not complicated. <laughs> to other people, it might appear complicated. But that's because they don't read the scientific literature. If you sit down and read the papers, then you'll completely understand what I'm saying. If you don't read the papers, then maybe it's very complicated. So, what? Yeah, well, it continues to get energy from fermentation, not respiration. Okay, so... So, so that's how the cancer cell grows, dysregulated. It's a fermentation metabolism lead, uh, uh, underlying the dysregulated cell growth. So it's very simple. Uh, if they ferment... Uh, what do the, what are the fuels to allow fermentation to take place? Glucose and glutamine, only two fuels. Two. Those the cancer cell cannot grow. It cannot. It uses those fuels for fermentation. So, uh, once you stop the fermentation fuel, the cancer cell cannot grow. It dies. And no radiation, no chemo. Yeah, and this is not the the kind of respiration, right? Where you we are breathing, right? It's not necessarily inputs, but out, but it's what's transported around in the body, and where the cell prefers the sugar. But why would the cell use the the sugar instead of the oxygen? Like, what kind of conditions need to be? They're in the body because the, the whole uh, the, process the, the, of fermentation to start. Yeah, well, that comes from, okay. <clears throat> Anything that can chronically damage the ability of the mitochondria to generate energy through oxygen mm -hmm. can potentially cause cancer, okay? So some people get exposed to carcinogen, mm -hmm. uh, which is a chemical that causes cancer. The chemical causes cancer because it damages oxidative phosphorylation in the mitochondria, okay? Mm -hmm. Some people get cancer by, by virus, like papillomavirus. Uh, now they require everybody to get vaccinated against papillomavirus. Papillomavirus causes uterine cancer, uterine cancer, and, 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 and other kinds of cancers. Uh, the virus enters the cell and damages oxidative phosphorylation, causing the cell to go and become fermentative and thereby losing uh, growth control in, in the uterus, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, in the breast, uh, milk, the milk duct in the breast can become blocked, uh, leading to chronic inflammation. Chronic inflammation will damage mitochondria in some cell or tissue, okay? Um, Intermittent hypoxia can damage respiration mm -hmm. in the cell. Intermittent hypoxia, which is uh, either a, a, a milk duct occlusion or some other vascular uh, dysfunction leading to chronic inflammation, damaged mitochondrial respiration. Uh, then you have um, a uh, cancer is more common for people than younger people mainly because the damage to the mitochondria can occur more gradually the longer you live on the planet. Um, type 2 diabetes, obesity, all of these conditions increase uh, inflammation in the body. Inflammation can damage mitochondria in some cell or tissue leading to uh, cancer. Ir chronic irritation can lead to melanoma, can lead to colon cancer can lead to breast cancer, can lead to all of these things. So all cancers come from chronic damage to oxidative phosphorylation. And if the cells, usually that will kill cells, but if the cell can upregulate fermentation, it can bypass the natural death pathway and thereby become dysregulated growth and cancer. So we clearly understand the origin of cancer, how it starts, uh, what, what it needs to grow, and what's more important, how to stop it and manage it. We know all of this clearly now. So the problem is nobody believes it and nobody wants to act upon it uh, or understand it. So consequently, millions of people must die 
needlessly throughout the world because people cannot understand what I just said. So basically, to summarize, you have to take care of your mitochondria. If you're... Exactly. Yes. Wait, 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 stop. Say that again. <laughs> you must take care of your mitochondria. You must take care of your mitochondria. <laughs> yes. And exercise mm -hmm. and uh, correct eating is the way to best uh, do this. Now, of course, some people like to party. Uh, some people like to drink and smoke and do all these kinds of things that we all, that many people like to do. Um, as long as you don't do it too much. Uh, so if people feel like, oh, I went to a party and I drank and I smoked, uh, now I put myself at risk for cancer, what can I do? Okay, then uh, stop eating for two days uh, and drink water only and reconfigure and re uh, reestablish health of your mitochondria. Um, and uh, you might be able to delay this. Uh, uh, try to avoid obesity. Try to avoid type 2 diabetes. All these diseases are all, all related to mitochondrial dysfunction. So in one way or the other. So people now should know what to do. Uh, I'm not saying everybody should, you know, uh, do water only fasting. But I'm saying now we understand what causes cancer. We should be able to uh, adjust diet and lifestyle to, to deal with that. Smoke cigarettes all day long. They put themselves at risk for lung cancer, colon cancer, and other cancers. But, I, you know, you smoke one cigarette a, a, a day or, or one cigar a week, uh, I, I don't think that's going to kill you. Okay. So, uh, or give you, it's, gonna, it's not going to increase your risk for cancer too much. If you want to be pure, mm -hmm. and most humans are not pure, you do water-only fasting, mm -hmm. right? And most people don't want to do that. So uh, you think Italians want to go out and just drink water for a week? I don't think so, <laughs> right? Who wants to do that? Germans are going to do that. I don't think so either. You know, Chinese, nah, nah. Most people are not going to do these kinds of things, right? <laughs> Even though that's what would prevent cancer. Cancer is a disease of diet and lifestyle. Uh, primitive people, uh, aboriginal people, rarely had cancer. So our ancestors of 50,000 years ago, cancer was extremely rare. Uh, uh, even in, Even today, in Aboriginal populations, um, cancer is very, very rare. In Eskimos and Africans and uh, South American jungle people, Aboriginal people live in, in, a, in a lifestyle similar to 50,000 mm -hmm. years ago. So uh, cancer is extremely rare. Um, cancer is very rare in, in the wolf, in the wolf. Uh, cancer in domestic, all domestic dogs uh, came from the wolf. Um, but cancer is number one killer of domestic dogs. Uh, dogs eat the same food we eat. I mean, they're eating too much of the wrong food and they get cancer. Uh, wolf eats natural things. Uh, anybody who lives in the paleolithic lifestyle is at much lower risk for cancer. Paleolithic, how we did it, how we lived uh, 50,000 years ago. Okay. What did you eat? What did our ancestors eat 50,000 years ago? They ate animals. Uh, they ate whatever kind of plants uh, and berries and things like this. Uh, they exercised a lot. You had to chase and kill the deer in order to eat the deer, okay? Today we drive up to McDonald's and they pass the food through the window and you don't even have to get out of the car to get uh, the food, right? Yeah. And therefore, you get diabetes, obesity, and cancer, and dementia, and all the kinds of things because of diet and lifestyle. So, uh, you know, but no one wants to go and kill deers and eat deer. So uh, they prefer to have someone else kill it and feed it to them. <laughs> no, no rice, no pasta, <laughs> no bread. You know, <laughs> you didn't have, we didn't have any of that stuff. 50,000 years ago. You know, absolutely. Uh, I mean, our, our species existed, I think, from one million years. Uh, uh, human, the human is about one million. Some people say six culture started maybe 
600,000 years ago. Um, you know, but that's not long. People say, oh, 600,000 years, a long time. No, it's not. The, the earth is uh, uh, 4 billion years old, 3.5 billion years old. Yeah. So the human species has only been on the planet for a short period of time, right? And already we have cancer and diabetes. <laughs> obesity, right? The obesity. When you see an obese person, they are the survivors from the uh, Paleolithic period. They, that's evolution in action. Those people are living in the wrong environment today, but they were the people that survived famine and starvation. Their body could hold all this energy. Now they eat cannolis every day and eat bread with butter on it and they get fat, you know? So uh, this is, and then they get diabetes and then they get cancer. I mean, this is not a, this is not a complicated problem. If you go back and, uh, okay, eat, um, yeah, what did we eat? Okay, we killed uh, am animals. Human beings killed animals. We did not evolve as a vegetarian species. If we were all vegetarians like the cow, we would not exist today. So uh, we eat cows, right? We eat pigs. We eat anything that walks or crawls. We'll even eat each other occasionally, cannibals, right? That was part of our existence. So, um, but uh, yeah, meat was always part of the uh, uh, human diet. Uh, vegetables were always part of the, we're what we call omnivores. We eat everything. Uh, we can uh, eat everything. Now, even to manage cancer, if you are a vegan or vegetarian or a carnivore or whatever, uh, pescatarian, whatever they want to call these guys who eat only fish, you know, whatever it is, you just measure your blood sugar and ketones and it tells you uh, what level of health you're in. So it doesn't make any difference what you eat. As long as you can keep a low GKI, glucose ketone index, you can, you can re reduce risk to cancer. You know, you don't do it all the time, but occasionally you might. So everybody goes out and buys a meter, you know, and double, and double checks their blood sugar. Uh, and people can monitor their own health. You don't need to go to the physician and tell you what's going on. You just know if you keep blood sugar low and ketones elevated, occasionally you're probably going to be healthier than the guy who doesn't do that. Yeah. Um, you know, people people can avoid those risk factors, I think, if they're aware of them. Unfortunately, sometimes the poor people find themselves in environments where there are more toxins in mm. the environment, uh, which unfortunately happens in many countries where the poor are always next to power plants or some something like that. Um, that's prevention. But I think, I think the uh, majority of people uh, want to know what you can do to manage the cancer once you are diagnosed with cancer. And there's where you can improve survival significantly. If you treat the disease as a mitochondrial metabolic disease, the probability of survival with a higher quality of life becomes much better uh, when you understand that cancer is metabolic disease and not a genetic disease. So I think it's an educational not only for the pharmaceutical, not only for the physicians, but also the general population as well. Once people understand what cancer is, they know how to prevent it. And if they get it, they know how to better treat it. So it'll be a learning process. Um, and what I say is, is going to be the standard in the future. Um, uh, eventually, people will become educated and will tell the, to tell the doctors, I, I don't want uh, chemo, I don't want radiation, I don't want immunotherapy. What what do you want? I want metabolic therapy. Please give me metabolic therapy. And if the if the doctor says, "Well, I don't know how to do that," the cancer patient will say, "Then I will find somebody who knows how to do that and go to them." Because it will change. Nobody wants radiation and chemo. Nobody wants that. They want to get rid of their cancer without toxicity. Metabolic therapy can do that. Yes. I mean, on the internet and media have a very powerful effect. Um, you know, they can get the word out, but you also have to be careful because there's a lot of things that people follow on the internet that are incorrect um, and are not supported by hard scientific work. Our work, we publish peer-reviewed scientific papers uh, establishing the concepts and and preclinical research showing what what is correct. And then you take that. If you understand cancer, you should be able to develop a therapy to manage the disease effectively. 
And we are doing that. More and more cancer patients with these advanced cancers are surviving better. Uh, why? Because we know we know what the nature of the disease is. The problem is um, the big the big hospitals and academic research centers uh, do not uh, um, yet uh, uh, accept accept this. They still think cancer is a genetic disease because they were indoctrinated, brainwashed to believe this kind of thing. They have never heard of the alternative. So they think, oh, no, I can't be right because we know cancer is a genetic disease. No, 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 no. They're incorrect. It's not a genetic disease. And then some people say, well, I can never accept cancer being anything other than genetic disease. So therefore, you, you have these forces that prevent metabolic therapy from being becoming the standard of care. And then uh, you're right about, you know, uh, how do you earn money if you are a physician you know, telling people don't eat carbohydrate foods. You know, it's like uh, how, how if you're a radiation oncologist, uh, why would you want to irradiate somebody when they don't need to be irradiated? Um, how do you justify irradiating somebody that I can, I can get rid of the tumor by t uh, restricting glucose and glutamine, and then the tumor disappears or becomes very indolent? Why should I go for radiation therapy? Doesn't make any sense. You know, why should I take a, a toxic chemical? to kill my tumor when I can just take away glucose and glutamine to kill the tumor. So, uh, um, you know, it's without causing toxicity or going bald or any of those kinds of things. So this is going to be a very difficult thing for many people to accept. But, hey, you want to manage cancer, you do it. You do it what we're saying. If not, then you go and take chemo and radiation. People, we're not stopping. Anybody who wants to have radiation and chemo, I'm not stopping them. I'm not telling them go and do radiation and chemo. If they want to do radiation and chemo, that's their that's their choice. The doctor says, "Oh yes, you must do radiation and chemo," and uh, he says that. Uh, well, what about other things? Well, radiation and chemo are the only things that I know about. So um, until he knows, does he know uh, the Warburg theory of cancer? Does the physician understand that glucose and glutamine are the only fuels driving the cancer that he's trying to manage? If not, then go find somebody else that does understand this. You know, the the field is going to have to change quickly. Otherwise, we're killing all these poor people are dying. Yes, unfortunately. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of like your patients' transformations that you've seen, so that people yeah, have well, an idea I, I think, about what's um, possible? Uh, there's a, there's a new film coming out uh, called The Cancer mm -hmm. Revolution. Uh, it's a documentary film, and they interview many many uh, stage four cancer patients who who, uh, what they call terminal, uh, who are no longer terminal. Um, so there's, uh, they relay their stories. Uh, Pablo Kelly from England, uh, he's on the web now telling everybody how he survived glioblastoma um, with metabolic therapy. So more and more people uh, who should be dead uh, are telling others what they did to survive. And um, so those guys become mm -hmm. advocates uh, to the metabolic therapy. And, um, you know, uh, more and more of these people are appearing on the social media. So uh, I think, uh, and that's another motivational factor. They want to be, they, they can tell others what they did to survive. And so even with stage four cancer, there's hope, basically. Yeah. You know, they always say terminal cancer. Um, people say, oh, I, I'm diagnosed with terminal cancer. Who says that terminal cancer? The guy who's treating you with radiation and chemo is telling you it's a terminal cancer because, you know, we did everything to the patient and the cancer's still there. Yeah, you did everything except target glucose and glutamine. You know, once you start targeting glucose and glutamine and transitioning the body to ketosis, you'll do much better. Now, and that doesn't mean, unfortunately, people, so many people come to me uh, after uh, chemo and radiation and immunotherapy, none of that stuff works. And then the physician says, oh, there's nothing more we can do. Uh, well, you did almost everything to kill the poor patient, and, and, and now, now you're telling me you can't do it anymore. So, um, you know, uh, not, and then the patient tries metabolic therapy and it doesn't work, only because the body has been so beat up and destroyed by toxic poisons and radiation that the body can no longer rally in a healthy way to defeat the cancer. 
So uh, uh, usually most of the people who start metabolic therapy up front um, really do well, and they never need radiation or chemo. And if they do chemo, uh, it's, it's very low dose uh, for a much shorter period of time with minimal, if any, toxicity. Feeds cancer if you have the cancer. Sugar will feed it. Sugar doesn't cause mm -hmm. cancer. If you eat too much carbohydrates and get in mm -hmm. inflammation in the body, like obesity and type 2 diabetes, that is a risk factor for causing cancer. So uh, sugar mm -hmm. by itself is not a carcinogen. Okay. Uh, but too much sugar in the body can cause inflammation. Inflammation can cause mm -hmm. cancer. Okay. So, uh, again, it's all one of degree. So I'm not telling people don't go out and eat uh, cannoli, you know, or eat stop eating pizza or, you know, whatever else, potatoes and pasta. No, uh, I'm, I'm saying if you don't have cancer, you can eat the cannoli and the pizza and the pasta or the potato or the bread. No, no, you actually, there's a lot of people who do that. Uh, some people decide to go on a ketogenic diet for, say, three or four weeks. Um, they do that to get healthy. Uh, they get, they lose weight. Uh, they get healthier, uh, and then they feel good. And some people are always on that mm -hmm. kind of a diet. Uh, I have friends that are always in some sort of ketosis. Um, you know, they don't, you know, I, I like to drink whiskey every now and then and eat bread. You know, uh, I, I would have to, uh, intermittent fasting is easier than going on these long-term ketogenic diets and things like this. You know, so yeah, beer. I mean, mm -hmm. I like beer, uh, but if I had cancer, I could not drink okay. beer. So, but I don't have cancer, so I'll drink beer. And if I ever get cancer, okay. I don't drink beer. So um, you do, and you try to reduce what you, the risk factors, you try to avoid risk factors. Don't forget, cancer is a disease of the lifestyle. And uh, it's a part of being in a civilized society, the risk for cancer. And no one wants to go back and to live in a primitive uh, Paleolithic period. Nobody wants to do that. So we have to just know things. How do I reduce risk? And if I get cancer, what can I do to manage the disease without toxicity? This is the knowledge that we are uh, showing what to do and how to do it. I think. Yeah, well, sometimes people don't want things to be simple. They love complicated. It makes them feel good that they can understand something complicated. Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's human nature. It's basically human nature. We're all the same. Everybody's the same. We're all humans. We all think the same way. You know, we all have very... The only thing that makes us different is culture. Culture and religion changes the way our brains think. But basically, we're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. So... Uh, <laughs> your brain can be working different ways. Anyway, uh, I will let you go. I have a meeting yes. to go to. So, Thank you so uh, much for coming on. But uh, I hope I hope this helps your podcast and uh, gets information. Thank, out. Thank you so much. I hope. Okay. It